Today's been a day for making merit on a large scale. All the generosity, the gifts of material things, the gift of our time, the gift of our energy. Observing the precepts. And it's good to top it off with meditation, because this is what it's all about. Training the mind. Because it's only when the mind is trained that we can find true happiness. And meritorious acts and decisions and words. that we've engaged in throughout the day. These are conducive to training the mind. They give the mind strength. These are good things to do, and they give good results. Here in the West, the word merit doesn't get much publicity. It's because people misunderstand it. They tend to think of it as brownie points, and it seems very acquisitive. But as the Buddha said, acts of merit are another word for happiness. There's a happiness in the doing, and there's a happiness in the result. Just as there was happiness in the planning, something you want to do, you want to do good. It makes you feel good inside. It's one of those cases where doing good and feeling good come together. And it is a special kind of happiness, the happiness that comes with merit. You reflect on the actions, you haven't harmed anybody. You reflect on the results. They do good for the world. This is what gives the mind strength, because it's common for the mind to be looking for happiness. And the problem is that for most of us, our search goes off in the wrong direction. That's why the Buddha's guidance is so valuable. He says, yes, it's okay to want happiness. In fact, you can develop lots of good qualities if you do it properly. But the problem is most of us don't do it properly. We think of happiness as pleasures of various kinds, wealth, status, praise, pleasures of the senses. And that kind of pleasure actually creates difficulties, creates divisions. And it doesn't necessarily in, encourage truthfulness, because a lot of wealth in the world can be attained through unskillful and untruthful ways. People often gain status and by abusing one another, taking advantage of one another. And the praise for the world is pretty unprincipled. People will praise you for doing all kinds of horrible things, and they'll criticize you for doing good things. That's the way of the world is. As John Lee used to say, the, the goods of the world are not really good. what's real about the world. It's not really good. And with all those kinds of pleasures, there's all those forms of happiness that it's, it's divisive because when one person gets it, another person has to lose, or many other people have to lose. When you gain wealth, that means somebody else has lost something. When you gain status, there's somebody else who may have wanted that status. They can't get it. The same with praise, the same with physical pleasures. Your gain is someone else's loss, sometimes someone else's gain is your loss. And the qualities of the mind that go along with it, both with the loss and with the gain, can be really unskillful, a lot of greed, aversion, and delusion. So you want happiness that doesn't create those divisions and really does develop good qualities of mind. As the Buddha said, that wisdom begins with the question, what, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. That's wise because you realize that your actions do make a difference and your happiness does depend on your actions. And that long-term happiness is better than short-term. It's a sign of heedfulness. You realize that there are some pleasures out there that really quickly turn into pain. And so you want to look for something that's lasting.
That's the beginning of wisdom. And that compassion comes along with that, because you realize if you want your happiness to be lasting, it can't harm other pe people, other beings, because they're going to fight against it. You have to fight to keep them away. Then eventually that happiness is going to end. So we look for happiness that doesn't create any jealousy in anyone else and doesn't harm anybody else. There's that passage where King Vasanity is in his chambers with his, one of his queens, Queen Malika. He turns to her in a tender moment and says, Malika, is there anyone you love more than yourself? And you can imagine what is on his mind. But she's not playing along. She says, no, Your Majesty, there's no one I love more than myself. And how about you? Is there anyone you love more than yourself? And presented with an honest person like that, the King Basenia has to say, well, no, it's true. There's no one I love more than myself. So end of scene. The king goes down from the palace, goes to see the Buddha, and reports the conversation between the two of them. And the Buddha says, she's right. You could search the whole world, and you never find anyone you love more than yourself, in the same way other beings love themselves fiercely, too. So the Buddha's conclusion is not dog-eat-dog, dog, and it's the exact opposite. He said, for that reason you would never want to harm anyone. You can think of that in two ways, well, just in practical terms. if. If your happiness depends on someone else's misery, they're not going to stand for it, and they will try to destroy your happiness. But you also think of it in terms of empathy. You realize okay, everybody else is motivated by that same self-love that you are. And you can empathize with that, and you really don't want to harm them. So desire for true happiness is also the beginning not only of wisdom, but also of compassion. And then when you actually follow through on that, trying to figure out, okay, what, when I do it, will harm nobody. That's how you develop purity. As the Buddha told Rahula, examine your actions before you do them. Try to anticipate the results, and if you anticipate any harm for yourself or for others, or both, you don't do the action. If you don't foresee any harm, go ahead. While you're doing it, if any harm comes up, you stop. If you don't see any harm, continue with the action. When the action is done, you look at the long-term results. And if you see that you did actually end up harming somebody, you want to learn a lesson from that. Resolve never to repeat that mistake again. If you don't see any harm, then he says, take joy in the fact that you're, pro you're progressing in the training. This applies to your physical actions, your verbal actions, your mental actions. And this, the Buddha said, is how people develop purity, not just wishing for long-term happiness, but actually looking at your actions, see that they cause no harm, and then learning from your mistakes. That's how he said, that's how your actions become pure. So there you are, wisdom, compassion, purity, the traditional virtues of the Buddha come from a wise pursuit of happiness. This is what we're trying to do as we develop merit, pursue happiness in a wise way. As we're sitting here meditating, this too is a form of merit, trying to develop a sense of ease and well-being with the breath, trying to gain strength from within in this way. It takes nothing from anyone else. You're not harming anybody. You're not breaking any of the precepts. You're developing your own inner resources. Areas that tend to get neglected. Find your own inner resource of strength. So instead of using your ability to think, simply to worry and scheme, you use it to develop a sense of well-being inside, develop a strength inside that you can depend on. With that strength comes a sense of security, changes the 
dynamic of your life. Because if your happiness depends on things outside, you're always going to be running around trying to straighten out things outside. And some things are amenable to straightening out, and a lot of things are not. And if those things don't go as you want them, there you are. You've got a problem. You have no basis for your happiness. But if you learn how to base your happiness within, and the good qualities of mind that you develop, the sense of well-being that comes, say, from mindfulness, concentration, and even more, the lightness of mind that comes with discernment. This is an important indication of discernment. It makes the mind feel lighter, more spacious, makes it feel free. If our thinking weighs us down, it's not wise thinking. So you learn how to think in ways that free the mind, liberate the mind. Give it strength. When you can develop inner resources like this, inner strength like this, okay, then you don't have to lean on other people so much, lean on other things so much. You can stand straight and tall. And this is what's meant by merit. Perhaps merit is a bad translation. It's hard to, though, to figure out another translation for the Pali word bunya. But it is another word for happiness, a sense of well-being that comes from within, that comes from strength of mind. And that strength of mind comes from resources you already have, so try to develop them. And in doing so, you develop wisdom, compassion, purity, all the good qualities of mind, which is why the practice of merit is not something to be overlooked. It's what gives us strength to continue on the path.